Turn with me to John chapter number five. Tell me you may be like, wow, you guys sure sing a lot. And, uh, you know, part of why we spend so much time in song, because sometimes, you know, your soul is needing some healing that only the melodies can provide. And, you know, it's always good to let your soul get what your soul needs, because sometimes when you out there uh, caught up in the hustle and bustle, how many know your soul can be under assault on a regular basis? So I just encourage all of you, amen, even if you don't feel like you need it, just close your eyes and just rock side to side, and maybe you'll get in touch with that part of you that does. And, uh, you know, it, it, it'll... It'll be a great blessing to you. We're going to continue in this series uh, that we're on, uh, the on ramp series. Today we're talking about rest. We're talking about rest. We're talking about rest. So I'll just start with the book of John, uh, verse number, chapter number five, verse number one. John is, again, one of the four gospels, one of these eyewitness accounts of the work that Jesus did, the words that Jesus spoke. If anything, John was trying to make this argument to many who thought that Jesus uh, was not a real human being. Uh, they, they knew Jesus was here, but back in some of the, the Greek and uh, 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 antiquities time they all believed in ghosts and they believed in spirits that could manifest themselves and there was this idea that because of all the great things that people saw Jesus do they did not regard him to be human they thought he was uh, a spirit who just appeared to be human so throughout the book of John John is fighting against this teaching this idea it was called at the time Gnosticism this idea that Jesus was not fully human he just was a spirit that appeared to be human. And part of what John was doing throughout this gospel uh, that is somewhat different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke is that John is attempting to make very clear the connection between Jesus, humanity, and his divinity. This is and has been one of the bedrock ideas of Christian faith that Jesus was both human and divine. He was God-man, if you will. And John was making many, many writings and recollections. If you read the last few chapters or last few verses, if you will, of the book of John, John says there are so many things that Jesus did, we couldn't put them all in a book. But what we did include, we included so you may come to believe that Jesus was the Christ. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, the scripture always creates lots of room for doubt. Hello, somebody. Amen. Amen. Scripture is good in creating doubt and, and unbelief and make you scratch your head and be like, what? Come on now. What you talking about, Willis? This, this, can't, be, this can't be that. That's why John closes out his book by saying, there are many other things I could do. But this is trying to cover your doubt gap, that gap that is doubt and hard to believe so you may come to know that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. So we find the book of John chapter 5 picking up one of these many instances where Jesus is doing one of these spectacular things uh, that many of us take for granted, especially if we've been in church for a while. This just sounds normal. Hey, Jesus heals all the time. What's the big deal, right? Well, for some of the rest of us, uh, if you take a look and slow down the process, you may start to see, wow, this Jesus guy, he may scare me a little bit if I've seen him doing all the stuff he's doing. John chapter number 5, verse 1, may be on the screen. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. After this, there was a festival of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. While he was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, there is a pool called Bethsaida which has five porticos or five like uh, 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 portals where water uh, kind of, you know, just comes through there with all kinds of veracity and speed. Uh, in these uh, porticos, uh, in these uh, 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 pools laid many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. That's a long time. 
When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, Jesus said to him, do you want to be made well? Other versions say, do you want to be made whole? Verse number seven, the sick man answered Jesus, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well. He took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk about rest and Sabbath. Somebody say, I need to catch my breath. I need to catch my breath. Now, it's so important to appreciate again that here in the book of John, Jesus is constantly making every effort to demonstrate through his own not just words but deeds that he is who many have been waiting for. How many of you know that you can be waiting your whole life for a blessing and not realize the blessing when the blessing shows up? Because as you're waiting, you may start to forget or not appreciate what you really were asking for when you first asked. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of you know that time is the greatest enemy oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. to your blessing? Uh huh. Because the longer it takes for some of us, not all of us, but most of us, the longer it takes for the thing to happen, many of us can get pretty restless. And in our restlessness, we could settle for something that is less than what your blessing is really about to give you. And how many know then when you settle for your less than, that less than may change you and cause you to forget what you really was asking for in the beginning. Then you'll be left to make lemonade, amen, just trying to figure out what you're going to do with all this stuff I got. If you take a serious look then at Jesus, <laughs> you had to include a little reference to it, amen. If you take a look at Jesus, Jesus was trying to help all of those around him to appreciate and to know who he was. And he would make declarations in this regard. We, he would say, I am the bread of life. If you eat from me, you will never hunger again. I am the true vine. If you are connected to me, you will produce much fruit. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the gate. He told the woman at the well, I am the water. Right. right? That Jesus is making these declarations. Now to us, it's not a big deal because many of us make all kind of declarations about who we are. And it's often grounded in something pretty limited that this post-modernity uh, era has gifted to us. But when Jesus is speaking, Jesus is going back into the Jewish kind of expression, understanding that if you're walking around using the Hebrew construction that says, I am, you are actually claiming to be God. And quiet as it's kept, that's why Jesus ended up on the cross. Man, the Jews didn't like that. These, these Pharisees said, not all the Jews, a lot of the Jews, they was hanging out with Jesus, especially when he was feeding folk, amen, and healing folk. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm for this Jesus. Like, we're the next, we're the next appointment. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they didn't like that Jesus was making all of these, these, these radical claims. What is at stake for you and I if we were to fully believe that Jesus is the great I am. 
that he is more than just a prophet, more than just some nice uh, fellow who came around and had 12 or so homeless guys walking around with him. He was more than this radical community organizer. He was more than this liberationist. He was really God who came to set the world back right side up. Now, realizing that this Jesus is the I am is such a great blessing when you understand that when God revealed God's self to the Hebrew nation back with Moses talking about I am the actual best explanation or translation is not just I am but God told them I will be whatever you need me to be so Jesus goes down the line saying, I am the bread of life for all you that are hungry. Why? Because they understood that God was saying to them way back in the day, I will be whatever you need me to be. If you're thirsty, Jesus says, I am the well that never runs dry. If you're hurting, Jesus says, I am your healer that healeth you. If you're lonely, Jesus says, I am the one who will never leave you nor forsake you. If you're in a fight, Jesus says, I am your fighter, your, 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 your uh, Jehovah, uh, uh, one of them Jehovah's. Mm -mm -mm. But he wanted them. Give your neighbor a high five and tell Jesus wanted them. Amen. He just, he wanted them. And when you know that Jesus is one of them, how many of you know that you then have a choice on how to live the rest of your life in light of this truth that Jesus will be for you whatever you need him to be? I want to argue to you today that the reason why many of us, certainly me, I, can get so restless is because there are times I forget Jesus is the I am. So I'll get all nervous, filled with anxiety, worry and concern because I forget. And when you forget that Jesus is the I am, guess whose I am starts to step to the front? <laughs> I am Michael McBride. Touch your neighbor, somebody. Amen. But how many of you know that me being Michael McBride is a just such a whack, <laughs> pale comparison to everything Jesus is saying Jesus is going to be? You see, part again of what this idea that Jesus being the I am means for you and I is that it gives you the opportunity to rest in who Jesus said Jesus would be. Now it is hard, truth be told, in our human weakness to trust that Jesus will be for us but we're not able to be for ourselves. Especially in those moments when all hell is breaking loose. It is then to me even more of a reason for us to practice this idea of what the scripture lifts up at the end of the passage. That day was a Sabbath. You see, in the biblical text and tradition, particularly in the Hebrew uh, scriptures, the Sabbath is the biblical concept for rest. To take a Sabbath flows out of the creation narratives, at least as we have received them. It is introduced to the children of Israel, to all who will follow the Torah, as one of the most important uh, uh, practices to keep. That you had to every seventh day rest. They couldn't just keep wrecking and rolling and moving with a great, you know, busyness and, and, and just blow through the Sabbath. Why? Because it seems to suggest that God is trying to help you and I 
appreciate our limitations as human beings that even the great big God who created everything told us about his creation process by saying at the end of my creative work I had to take a rest so if I'm God mm -hmm, and I gotta take a time out chill pill why do you think you can work seven days a week 50 hours a day no not 50 or some of y'all you know you got three computers in front of you and your mind just and you just go 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 and you we find ourselves just totally exhausted frustrated forgetting what God originally promised to us which was rest now I'm so appreciative again that when God gave us this principle of Sabbath it means originally to cease to stop to <laughs> chill out God in God's goodness understood that it is a recipe for disaster for you and I to just keep moving, 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 moving without taking time to rest. Now, because the, you know, all of us who, whenever we hear a word from God or we think it's something transcendent or divine, how many of you know that we can take a good thing and turn it into a terrible thing? God's gift can become a burden when overdetermined by human weakness. The blessing that God gives you can become a curse when you allow your humanity to get too overdetermined in what God has blessed you with. And this is the example of how this happened with the children of Israel. God told them, take the Sabbath. So they said, that's cool, that's great. Uh, but by the time, several hundred years later, Jesus shows up on the scene they had turned these Ten Commandments, the Torah, into 600 amendments. Thou shalt not kill, except when. <laughs> Thou shalt not lie, except when. And it was all these amendments that they put in there. Why? Because how do we know when human weakness gets introduced to a good thing, it can turn the good thing into a burden. And it became harder for them. They ended up seeming like they were working more on the Sabbath just to keep the Sabbath. Hello, somebody. How many ever had that kind of experience before, right? Like you, you, you end up doing more trying to maintain and sustain a thing that's supposed to be a blessing in your life. So it ain't the gift that keeps on giving. It's the gift that causes you more work. And this is what is so powerful, I believe, of this passage we find Jesus encountering this, 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 this group of folk who were in this kind of hall or pools at the gate in Jerusalem. Jesus is interacting with them. And, and because it's the Sabbath, I want to lift up a few things out of this passage that happened on the Sabbath as a way to help you and I feel challenged because you know what is a gospel that does not challenge you? What good is that? Amen. If you want a motivational speech, you should go listen to Joel Osteen or something. Amen. <laughs> well, we're going to try to work you out a little bit in here. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell her, let's work out a little bit. Let's work out a little bit. This Sabbath, oh, I'm sorry, that was a little, a little low blow. I didn't mean no harm. But this Sabbath that God would give to us, I think, is intended to help you have a rest from so you can have rest for. Everybody say from. Everybody say for. Everybody say from. Everybody say for. Keeping the Sabbath is a way to honor that God wants you to withdraw from some things 
so you can be engaged powerly, powerfully, powerly. What is that? <laughs> I can't even talk up in here. You can be engaged powerfully mm -hmm, for God's work. So what is the first thing that I want to lift up in this passage that God would have you rest from? The first thing is God would have you rest from failed systems. Everybody say failed systems. Now it's so important to appreciate that you need a Sabbath so you can get some rest, reprieve, unplug from the matrix. This failed system that would keep you going until you drop and make you feel like the world will not go on unless you write that one more paper, unless you finish that one more project, unless you make that other dollar, unless you own and, 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 and the system, this fallen, broken system will cause you to operate from scarcity rather than abundance. Make you think that you're running out of time when you actually got more time. Hello, somebody. Right? I mean, whatever you don't finish on Friday, guess what? Mondays. Oh, but I got this, I got that. Well, you know, it is your right to make sure that you are not finding failed systems or allowing failed systems to limit and overdetermine your life. Here in this passage, we see so powerfully this man, 30 something years, laying at the pool of Bethsaida, he was there. And the scripture says, he was ill, sick, at Bethsaida, 38 years, this, even though some folk are being healed, is an expression of a failed system. Because Bethsaida, many folk regarded it to be almost like a, a, a therapeutic pool. It was almost like hot springs, if you will, some folks have said. And I'm sure that there were acts of divine healing happening there from time to time because it would not I think have gotten such notoriety if it was just something that could be so easily explained. They thought that there was an angel or some kind of being that would come down and actually touch the waters and trouble the waters and whoever got into the water first would emerge healed. So this became a very important kind of thing that people would just lay there randomly waiting for the troubling of the waters. And if they were blind, paralyzed, lame, whoever would get in the pool first would be healed. Now, what is the problem with such a system? Well, the first problem is not everyone gets healed. So it creates a certain kind of competitiveness, right, that is grounded in everybody's own self-interest. I got to hurry up and get in this pool because I've been here and I need to be well. 38 years, we see this man sitting by this pool and obviously he's watching others get what they need, but he himself is not able by participating in this system to be fulfilled. Can you make any connections in your own life? I don't know. Anywhere? <laughs> Just maybe one intersection of how we are involved and participating, often unbeknown to us. That's why, folks, it's so popular. Everybody say, stay woke, you know. Stay woke. <laughs> stay woke. You better get woke. <laughs> but I found that no matter how woke you get, our human weakness still gets us attached to systems. You can be woke in your politics and be, and be sleep in your interpersonal interactions. Hello, somebody. You can be woke in your money and be sleep in your, I don't know, study, your, your initiative, your ability to get the job done. 
If I were to talk to you for a few minutes about failed systems, I, I would want to lift up a whole bunch. Patriarchy, yes. uh, racism, white supremacy. But I don't want to bother, you know, everybody like that. So we're going to spend a few minutes on capitalism. How about that? Just to... <laughs> I thought that I was going to talk about, I don't know, the NBA or something, huh? No, we go. I'm not a, I'm not a, like, economist. I got a few folk in here I can see. I can bring you up here talk about capitalism. Let me just give an example of how this system we participate in has a little bit of a kind of, you know, mirror to the broken system that we read in this text. And let me just say this too, because I was talking to some of my friends who are from other countries that were indeed using another economic model and there was tyranny and authoritarianism run amok. And part of what I just want to express is there is no salvation in any particular economic system. Because any economic arrangement has lots of room for human weakness. But I do believe the Gospels give you and I the ability to critique, dismantle, and unmask the ways in which failed systems overdetermine our lives and keep us from being at rest. So if I were to talk about capitalism, particularly laissez-faire capitalism, this idea that our commodification, our, inter our radical person is reduced to our labor and our output. That if you're not valued as a creator of labor in this society, then your value diminishes. And it can lead to exploitation. It can lead to some folk being taken advantage of, some folk being locked in all kinds of dehumanizing ways of being related to their economic production. That those who can produce a lot for her, regardless of how they got it could indeed be more valuable than all of us who may not be able to produce as much. But don't you know that your worth is not connected to the production of economic materials? That God created you in God's image, period. <laughs> Man, that means there's inherent dignity and value in you even if you don't do nothing. Touch your neighbor. <laughs> Amen. If you don't do not one thing your whole life, God will look at you and be like, that still was a good creation. <laughs> but when you don't unplug from this capitalistic system, you will often find your whole life being overdetermined by what will you produce. How powerful can you become? What kind of promotion can you have? Which is totally antithetical to how God created the world. If Jesus said, I am, I will be whatever you need me to be. At some point, you unplugging from this failed system is necessary so you can then be reminded that God is more than enough. Hmm. How must you and I rest from participating or being overly determined in such a system that doesn't work? I mean, I was very captivated by this new report that came out that says San Francisco is like one of the top five places to live in the world. Costs. I mean, it is the bomb city. Well, it was when I was growing up there. I don't know what's going on here now. But now, one of the top five most expensive places to live in the world? That's, 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 that's some capitalism run amok. And many of us who, you know, live in this Bay Area, how many of us feel the pinch and the squeeze of trying to keep up in this failed system? See, I believe that God will provide for you and I, regardless of where we are, Regardless of what we do, God will provide as we learn to rest in God. So, the first question for your reflection, what systems are you participating in that are not life-giving and how can you take a Sabbath from that system to make or experience God's way? Everybody say, from failed systems. 
The second thing that the scripture lifts up that I think you and I must be willing to take a stop, a rest, a Sabbath is from harmful people. Tell your neighbor, I'm not talking about you though today, man. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> Verse 7 says, there is no one to help me. Someone else steps down ahead of me. See, I would expand this to something even greater. That God is trying to help you and I appreciate that there are some people, places, and things. That you need to take some rest from harmful people. People who kind of don't know they're reckless, but you always seem to get the result of their recklessness. Hello, somebody. People, places, and things which produce harm to your body. What does it mean for you to take a Sabbath from them? And again, a Sabbath is temporary. Some of it may need to turn into permanent, but you know, you start with the Sabbath. Yeah, I think I need to take a Sabbath from you for, you know, God took one day. So just start off one day a week. I need a break. I just need some room for me to breathe away from your harm. Now, I believe, again, this is such an important point, particularly we who are aware of our human weakness, because you can cause harm to people often not even aware. That's why it's good for you as a person, we as a community, to be aware of how many systems, many people, many places, many things, some of this stuff is very much unintentional. Some of this is unintentional. All of it is not just a conspiracy by the man. Although, you know, the man is real. <laughs> Touch your neighbor. I've met the man. Amen. <laughs> Talk about some bad intentions. Amen. But not everything is about the man. Some of it is about us. And about you. And about we. People, places, and things. And we have to be folk who are willing to take some responsibility that I need to take some rest from. Who are the from? Well, the man in the story, obviously surrounded by people who know he'd been there for a while. Somebody probably should have been there to help him. Nobody was. He felt abandoned. He felt forsaken. And because no one was there to help him, he was constantly being left with his needs unmet. People jumping in front of him. I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that a rest from people, places, and things is all about your self-care. And what does it mean for you to have self-care of your body? Of your soul, of your mind. Self-care must be a priority for the follower of Jesus. You can't just run yourself without interruption Ignoring the Sabbath command that God gave you to take care of yourself. I know you a husband and a wife, a partner, a homie, a friend, but everybody in your life should eventually give you some space for some what? Self-care. Some rest. This ain't no slave uh, 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 thing. To be mindful, a lot of us are living in environments that are very much uh, oppressive. But I do believe that God would have you to take some initiative in self-care. I have to take self-care. I've been flying all over the world, all over the country, and doing all this whole crazy stuff, trying to be faithful to this assignment. And, you know, I was, you know, Moses got on me. He said, you know, Pastor Mike, you done got fat again. You know, I'm just like. <laughs> he didn't say that, amen. <laughs> it, it, it's a rhetorical point for my sermon, amen. But he did encourage me. He said, Pastor Mike, you know, uh, 
you know, them exercises, and man, I get you, you got to get your metabolism right with this food. I know that, you know, I, get, I lost, what, about 60 pounds or something like that, or 40, I don't know how many pounds. I lost a few sizes, and then I, on the planes, trains, running all over here, running all over there, trying to be a favorite of my assignment, and I forgot that part of my Sabbath and self-care is to take care of this one body that God gave me. Now, I'm not hung up on weight, per se. I am very much serious about health. And you have to take good care of this one body. Everybody take your finger out and say, one body. <laughs> this is not the cyborg, you know, that's going to come out of the next Justice League where you get to get rid of parts and put another part in that don't know. One body, everybody say, one body. You get one of these jokers for your whole life. <laughs> And you got to take care of it. And if you don't take care of it, ain't nobody else going to take care of your body. At least you don't want them to take care of your body. So, you know, folks, you know, kind of cross boundaries. Be like, wait, no, I'm not, I don't need that kind of help. Mm hmm So, what are the people, places, and things, this is your question to wrestle with, causing harm and hindering your self-care? Can you name them and take a Sabbath from them? Remember, this is from. Let's get to the four, my last f four or five minutes. God would have you take a Sabbath from those things. Just as an example, probably a few other things we could list if we had another hour or so, but we don't. So you can take a Sabbath for, first thing I'll say is holistic healing. Holistic healing. Jesus said to the man, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? And sometimes in our religious practices, especially in our churches, Pentecost, charismatic, holiness, tongue talking, saved, sanctified, swing from the chandelier, roll on the pews and levitate through the room, churches. And I wanted to do all of that. Let's just be clear, all right? So don't think I'm telling you either or. I want you to do all that. Roll like a river roll. But it's important for us to not lose sight of the holistic nature that Sabbath affords you and I the ability to experience. It is not a coincidence that after Jesus did all these great actions, Scripture says Jesus would withdraw himself from the crowd yes. to recharge. Then he come back and engage with all these, what he called broods. No, that was John the Baptist. <laughs> broods of vipers and snakes. That's why they cut John the Baptist's head off. John, you know, John the Baptist cussing out people, you know. Like, oh, you ain't gonna cuss me out. Let's see how you can talk without your head, right? Just <laughs> all these engagements. Jesus withdrew himself, got charged up, and then came back. Withdraw, engage. Withdraw, engage. Do you want to be made well? It's a loaded question. Because we got to answer a few other questions. What does it mean to be well? What does it mean to be whole? What does it mean for you to be good? Like, all right. I mean, St. Augustine, one of the North African church fathers, love him, super deep guy. He says that, Wholeness is having your life rightly ordered with God. Rightly ordered. Which seems to suggest that you and I could be unrightly, no that's not right, mis dis disordered. Disordered. Out of order. You can be out of order out of alignment and when you are out of alignment listen with God that is where healing is needed and some of our
out of alignment are disorder, affections, relationships, ideas, purposes, are often again, going back to the first point I made earlier, about we can be waiting so long for whatever we think we need and we start to settle and that settling gets us off course. Oh man, I was in a meeting, we were talking about some strategy we doing around this political stuff and one of the brothers, deep brother, his name's Turha, I love him. He's like one of the smartest Black Panther cats I know and he just like, he said, you know McBride, what you gotta realize is when you're on a plane and you're flying, they are constantly either the, the computer or the pilot recalibrating and adjusting for the elements that they are flying through. Because you can be off just a little degree the whole trip and end up miles off course from your destination. I thought that was deep, right? You don't got to be off by miles in order to miss your destination. You can be off by degrees without your recalibration. Part of this holistic healing is necessary because God is trying to recalibrate you. You had a week, a heck of a week, a lemonade kind of week, amen. And God is trying to get some time with you. Listen. To recalibrate you. The Sabbath is an opportunity for God to recalibrate you. I know they let you down. Recalibration. I know you were hurt. Recalibration. I know you were frustrated. Recalibration. I know you were abused. Big recalibration. I know you were abandoned. Big recalibration. I know I did not answer your prayer at the timeline you thought I should. Huge recalibration. I know they died even though you thought they were going to live. Recalibration. When you don't recalibrate, you are disordered. And God is trying to help we, the people of God, to be in good, orderly relationship with God's purpose. What's the question then I want you to wrestle with? How committed can you be to being made whole? Will your Sabbath provide you healing, spiritual renewal, recalibration? If you don't recalibrate, that which got you off course can over-define you. You will be known more for your illness than your original created purpose. Recalibration. Last thing, and then we're going to spend a few minutes in some prayer. Rest for empowerment. Everybody say empowerment. 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 God wants to make you full of God's power so this new direction you come out of the Sabbath with, you can accomplish it. Jesus tells the man in the story, do you want to be made well? Man gave Jesus some excuses. I ain't got nobody to put me in a pool. Jesus didn't ask you about your support system. He didn't ask you about who was helping you. He just asked you, do you want to be whole? Ain't that somehow we can, you know, start talking to Jesus. Anybody? Okay. <laughs> I'm one of these people. I'm not going to ask anybody. I'm one of these people where I don't listen all that good. Like, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, like, you know, I, I, I could be in a conversation with folk, and, and they could say one thing. It was so embarrassing. I was in a, in, on a big old panel at this conference. Somebody asked me a question, and they said one thing that triggered me so bad. And I didn't hear the, the, the half, the last half of what they said. And I just got stuck on that. And my whole 10-minute response was on that one thing. They said, so are you going to answer the question? You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> we can respond. Hello, somebody to the minutia, mm -hmm, the small, sometimes insignificant part, rather than the actual real thing. Jesus wasn't asking him, where your help at? I don't know, people be abandoning me. <laughs> Jesus wasn't asking him, why are you not in the pool? I don't know, I'm not fast enough. <laughs> None of them questions, they wasn't Jesus' questions. Jesus said, do you want to be whole? Jesus ignores his answer. We serve a good God. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him we serve a good God. Because you know, our little answers, we can just be like, be like, I'm not, you know, 
<laughs> Jesus tells him, take up your mat and go and walk. And immediately the man takes up his mat and walks away. Healed. Sabbath for empowerment. Sabbath for new direction. God wants you to take rest so he can empower you. He can cause you to find yourself renewed and replenished for the journey ahead. Don't get hung up on the how more than what he is going to do. You just making space for the miraculous supernatural power of God to be manifest will set you up for a blessing, a rest that hopefully carries you throughout those days when you are not able to take rest. You see, the gift of the rest is that hopefully it is a way of life that spills over into the rest of your life. Not your life crashing into your rest. God wants us to be overflowing with the awareness of him being our I am. Because if he is our I am, we can always be at rest. Come on, let's stand. Let's.